Hey guys, Laura here. This is my top 10 favorite video games of all time. I actually made this list a while back, about five years ago to the day. It's pretty good, I'm proud of it, but my tastes have changed and it just seemed like it needed an update. Right before we start, I wanna say that none of these are review segments. I tried keeping discussions on each game really short so that we can get through the list at a nice pace and the video's not three hours long. I always have too much to say about things. I wanted to give a shout out to the World of Long Plays at longplay.eu. I lost a lot of footage in the making of this video, so some of it was done with theirs. And it's really cool that they let people do that. Enjoy the video. All right, right off the bat, let's go ahead and get this one out of the way. Life is Strange probably wouldn't make people's top 10 best video game list of all time. Hell, a lot of people don't like this one, and it's got a lot of things going against it. The graphics could have been running on a PlayStation 2. The animations are pretty bad. Like, look at this, what the fu- And it doesn't really have a lot of gameplay. The core mechanic is being able to rewind time simply so you could pick different options and dialogue trees. Good morning. How are the fish today? It's in an episodic format, which, you know, doesn't really help out. And the dialogue is... Um, listen to this. Now you're totally stuck in the retro zone. Sad face. Yeah, it doesn't get better. It actually gets worse. And there's a lot of references to pop culture that are just kind of shoehorned in there. And I swear to Christ, if Chloe calls her Supermax one more... Come on, Supermax. Fucking time! Get fucking tired! But, hear me out. The story, though a little convenient, like we never understand how Maxine can travel time if she just kind of wakes up and decides to do it, is pretty intriguing. You know, if for no other reason than you just kind of want to see where all the characters go from where they start and what certain people's deal is. And the gameplay is pretty nice. It's got a lot of environmental puzzles and it's pretty satisfying when you can go back in time and affect something or do something different. I just wanted to see what would happen if I did this. I'm gonna kill you. Our main character, Max, has a premonition that a tornado is gonna fucking wreck shit. But she wakes up in class and, after witnessing a murder in the bathroom, discovers she has the ability to travel back in time like a JoJo's character. Which isn't really a bad way to view the, uh, the game, like, the plot can be a little over the place and kind of convenient, but you're kind of here for the characters and see what happens, and in that regard, it's a little like watching JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Just without the Macho Man and ridiculous theatrics and, uh, you know, all the goofy shit that makes JoJo's fun, but, you know, otherwise, exactly the same, right? Life is Strange isn't for everyone, and I almost didn't put it on the list. Uh, there were a lot of games that came close to taking its spot. As a matter of fact, it wasn't in the uh, original 2015 list, and it wasn't in the uh, short list for this year either. I kind of kind of had to warm back up to it. It's also one of those games where you can't necessarily, you know, lose or fail. There's there's not like a lot of pressure because you probably always have the time to go back and change your decision if you're not feeling it in the moment. But with that comes the fact that you're shaping the story and you might not get the story that you really want. Uh, the least it about the story, the better. But despite this horrible fucking tween slang that you have to endure, a lot of the story moments are pretty emotional. You uh, this shit? Don't know. It seems like we were kids in real life. Yeah, even recording this footage, that shit still hurt me. But if I had to give one reason why it absolutely submits itself as one of my favorite games of all time, Episode 5. You, you either know or you don't. Unless you're... Unless you just don't really get emotional playing video games ever, it's probably gonna hit you hard. It hit me hard. And I'm not gonna be embarrassed to admit that. It's a good game. I definitely recommend you playing it once, even if it's probably just a one and done deal. I don't think this one holds up quite as well in replays, but I mean, hell, it's worth the money.
those who have known me for a long time are not surprised by this entry. I've been a big Tekken fan since as soon as I played the games. I've always loved 3D fighting games. As a matter of fact, they're what got me into the fighting genre to begin with. Stuff like Tekken, Soul Calibur, Virtual Fighter, Bushido Blade, they're my jam. I love them, and I've played them well before I ever touched a Street Fighter. But if I had to pick one that was my absolute favorite, hands down, Tekken Tag Tournament 2. Now you can't go wrong with a good Tekken. I'll live and die saying that you can go back to Tag 1, Tekken 5, even Tekken 4, and have a good time. I think they hold up really well for what they are. And Tekken 7 is a fantastic game. I probably played that the most these days, but you know, it it's a little different. The rage system just never really hit with me the way it does some people. But Tattoo is the epitome of what made Tekken great. It's got every character from the series history. It just It is big fan service, basically. Ridiculous combos that you can't do in any other entry. Uh, the tab mechanic, it goes without saying, is fantastic. It works just like it did in the original Tekken Tag Tournament, but the game just runs so much smoother and faster than it used to. It's got like a lot of good features you can actually use a custom soundtrack off your PlayStation 3 hard drive, which is ridiculous, honestly. I wish the PS4 supported this. It's even got four-player support, which, I mean, makes it a really ideal party game. As a matter of fact, I've heard that the Wii U version has, like, Mario Party-esque elements in it. I haven't played that one, though. Even without that, it's a great party game. Just you and three friends beating the shit out of each other. A lot of people criticize Tekken for being a little complicated, like the control scheme's really different from a 2D fighting game. Yeah, I, it's always made sense to me, dude. Maybe it, maybe I'm just used to it. I've enjoyed every entry in the franchise. Not really much to say without uh, getting into the nitty gritty of it. And I want these reviews to be pretty short, so if you like what you see, if fighting games are your thing, if you've never really like tried out a Tekken, or if you've loved some of the other ones, I, it doesn't matter what your situation is. Tech Attack Tournament 2, go try it out. You win. Despite the negativity I throw at Square Enix a lot of the time, I actually am a big fan of Final Fantasy. I think most of the games are really fun and, you know, recommendable. So personal favorites are, of course, 6 and 7. I think 5 is good for what it is. It's really good at just showing off how good the job system can be. And you know what? I don't hate 15. Yeah, I played it. I played the day one edition without any of the improvement patches. And I came away mostly thinking it was, you know, worth my time and money. I know that's not a popular opinion. And Final Fantasy 7 Remake? So good. I know my most viewed video, especially on Facebook, is shitting on how I thought Final Fantasy 7 Remake was going to be. Guys, it's fantastic. It it almost made this list. Like, it came really close. I, give it another year, and if I still feel the same way about it, it might actually be on this list. But if I had to pick my favorite Final Fantasy, and admittedly it's for personal reasons, I'd pick Final Fantasy X. Final Fantasy X has a pretty interesting setting. I like the South Pacific motif of the game. Wonderful cast of characters. The best turn-based combat we've seen in a Final Fantasy. I prefer this way more than the active time battle system. In Final Fantasy X, you can change your character in and out at will, meaning that all party members can be involved in battles, and it really makes them feel like all the party members have their place. Nobody really gets left behind, like in Final Fantasy VI, or even VII. The beginnings of the story are pretty similar to Grass. Our main character, Titus, Titus, Totos, I'm going to go with Titus. I know it's probably T-Dux, but, you know, whatever. Our main character gets isekai to a new world where a rampaging monster known as Sin pretty much comes every 10 years and wrecks shop. To defeat him, a summoner has to go get the final summon. So we join up with our summoner and her bodyguards as we go to get the final summon and defeat Sin once and for all. From there, Final Fantasy happens. I mean, shit, the plot goes all over the place. We see a lot of familiar items and enemies, familiar summons from the game's past make an appearance, gameplay archetypes that we've come to expect from the series are obviously present, and Yuna is a really fantastic main lead character. I know Titus is trying to convince us this is his story. He's gonna say that like 30 times, but, but no, Yuna steals the show. 
you are following to find out what happens to Yuna. She's probably the best example of a main female lead in a video game, which makes it really a shame that Square Enix kind of doesn't realize that. Like, you could tell Tidus is supposed to be our main character, but I mean, you know, whatever. The game's kind of personal to me. It was my first Final Fantasy, so that might be the reason why I think it's the best one. A lot of people tend to like their first Final Fantasy. But also, it does a lot with, like, themes of, you know, well, not so much the theme of Destiny, but like the theme of filling your expected role in society, which was something I used to struggle with a lot, and it also deals with the theme of religion, being devoted to religion, or or like being loyal to beliefs that you're just kind of told and taught when you're young and you don't really question it, which is something else I used to struggle with too. I think a lot of video games comment on like religion or faith or or you know the concept of gods or whatever and they kind of do it more for flavor but i really felt at the time i first played this game and even now that final fantasy tackles it a little bit more nuanced the graphics and animations hold up pretty well for a game that's 20 years old at this point the hd remasters are absolutely recommended they they made the game look a lot better than it did originally voice acting holds up pretty all right i mean we've done better but God, we've seen worse. Jesus Christ, we've seen worse. Hmm, let's see. What am I hungry for? Don't buy anything yet. We have a shopping list. We need to hurry. Everyone is waiting for us. It has a certain charm to it either way, and I wouldn't ever want to have to play the game with a new English dub. Not without the option to go back to the old one. Not much else to say without going into spoiler territory, uh, the Spear Grid is pretty cool. I've always kind of thought it was a little overhyped, but, like, it definitely helps replays. Unlike Final Fantasy VII, where you're pretty much going to get the same abilities in roughly the same order, the material system admittedly doesn't give you as much variety as you would inherently think. I think the Spear Grid, you can definitely mix up characters and make them go different directions, and the Remix Spear Grid in the remake is pretty pretty wild. I can't phantom anyone who would still want this video hasn't either played this game already or has already determined that it's not really their thing, but if you like turn-based RPGs or you like the other Final Fantasies or you're just looking for an easy way to kill 50 hours, I do highly recommend this one. I love the Metroidvania genre. I think they're really fun games. Stuff like Metroid, Symphony of the Night, Bloodstained Ritual of the Night, and they kind of take me back to where I used to play a lot of platformers as a kid on the NES. But they're really long commitments, especially when you don't have a lot of time, and sometimes when you do have the time, they can be a bit of a drag. The Ritual of the Night, for all the praise I can give it, starts to kind of lose its luster after, you know, a few dozen or so hours. Which is why I really value a game like Momodora. First off, there's not really anything wrong with it. It's super light off story, but great retro style graphics, great gameplay physics, a lot of fun power-ups, eerie cursed castle town to explore with a nice gothic theme. And the best part is, is that you can kind of play through the game on your initial playthrough in about three to four hours. It sounds like there wouldn't be a lot here, but actually, it's a lot of fun. I will absolutely take four or five solid jam-packed hours that I enjoy, then a 30-hour game that kind of like grinds to a halt and becomes derivative. Plus, I actually have the time to play it, so that's something. But the game actually does reward you for replaying it. Think of like the old Resident Evil games. They're really short. You can go through a Resident Evil game in a few hours, but on the replay, you can optimize your run, pick up collectibles that you didn't find, experiment with different ways, and generally, you know, play the game three or four times before you really see all that has to offer. I felt like Momodora is exactly the same way. Going through on your second or third time to optimize your run is a lot of fun. Since it doesn't take that long, you can feasibly be through it in an afternoon, which, for you know, for those of us who have to work full-time jobs, is really nice. 
Momodora may lack the variety of games like Ritual of the Night, but it's focused, it does offer enough for its runtime, and I mean, the game is pretty cheap. I mean, it routinely goes on sale for like $5. You can't be mad at a game that's that cheap. Even at its full price point, I think it's worth it. It was definitely the game of the year for whatever year it came out, 2016, I think. Um, it's definitely my favorite platformer that has come out this past generation, and I highly recommend it to fans of the genre. Give this one a try, won't regret it. Growing up, I played a lot of the original Nintendo, and I love that thing, I still have most of all my old carts, it's fantastic. But afterwards, my family upgraded directly to the PlayStation 1, and the rest is history. Everybody knows that I'm a huge Sony fanboy, but that means I missed out on a lot of the Sega Genesis games, which is a real shame because they had something really special with the Sonic franchise. I did get to play the original Sonic the Hedgehog as a teenager on one of those Sega plug and plays, and I got to play Sonic 3 on a PC collection that they sold in Walmart. This was a long time ago. Sega has traditionally been really good at making sure their old classics are accessible in a way I wish Nintendo was. So I still got to enjoy Sonic 3 and Knuckles in a genre with no shortages of great gems to play. Sonic 3 hit Knuckles really is something special. It's everything working together, like the general speed of the game is really fun. Levels are big and able to explore without feeling like they're too big or that you're getting bogged down. The game's got its share of power-ups, but it never gets weighed down with the need to have to balance them out. It's just all about moving to the right and having a grand old time, which is what Sonic games traditionally have always been good at. I know Sonic's kind of a meme. The franchise as a whole is not super good, but you really can't go wrong with any of the 2D Sonics. As a matter of fact, Sonic Mania is really damn good. I almost picked Mania over 3 and Knuckles. It's super solid stuff, but I went back to record this footage for Sonic 3 and Knuckles and fell in love with it all over again. I love this game. It also feels like a really good lean for a platformer. It takes about two settings of beef, but there is a save feature. The levels are varied enough, but it never goes off the hinge or make you feel like you're playing something from a different game. And the soundtrack is legendary. Everyone's commented on this music. You're listening to some of it right now. I don't have to tell you. I shouldn't have to tell you anything. This game speaks for itself. I'm sure everyone watching this video has played the game. Uh, go play it again. I'm sure you've forgotten how good it really is. I'm a believer that there isn't a bad mainline Resident Evil title. The old games are really fun, and I'm a hard defender on tank controls, so to me, going back to the old games, still as fun as they were 20 years ago. And even the action-packed titles, like 5 and 6, are fun. We can all agree that Resident Evil 6 might be one of the worst ones, but it's still a really damn good game. I'll jump into some co-op and enjoy that almost any day of the week. But I think Capcom really nailed it out of the park for Resident Evil 7. It's got both the creepy atmosphere and the slow-paced tension of the older titles while having a lot of fast-paced set pieces of 5 and 6. The setting also hits a little close to home. I live in Florida, but I live in that part of Florida that you could consider Alabama. So our main protagonist, Ethan, basically gets kidnapped by a bunch of Southern hicks in Louisiana. Um, I mean, obviously, real life people in the South aren't evil like this, but a lot of the trimmings and character types and slang in this game, you know, I grew up around in my childhood, so to see them subverted is legitimately upsetting to me. Which I love, it's why you play horror games, to be a little upset. Everybody wants to go back to how things were! Those are stupid! Bish! She doesn't understand that I don't... The bakers make 
fantastic antagonist. Each one has their own way of going about things and unique personality. So they don't necessarily feel like this like one collective that's more or less one entity. They feel like a family of people who are just in this situation together. And the conspiracy that they find themselves in is really intriguing. No spoilers obviously, but the twist at the end, man, that was that was some wild shit. The demo for this came out a number of years ago. It was after I made my original top 10 list and I loved that demo. I was just taken aback by like how fun and atmospheric it was. I played it like a hundred times. I think we have like four videos of it on the channel and the game itself doesn't disappoint. It pretty much picks up where the demo leaves off. Just throws you in this house having to survive against superhuman hillbilly hex. The first person angle was a really good choice on Capcom. I like third person as much as anyone, but the game really benefits from having limited visibility. And other than fixed camera angles, first person was a good way to accomplish that by still giving players the freedom to be able to look where they feel they need to look at any given time. The environmental puzzles aren't too overwhelming. I don't recall being stuck at a particular part because I couldn't figure out the leaps in logic that Capcom expected me to. The game does get hard. Lord, the game gets hard. It always seems like a fair challenge, and it always seems like there's generally multiple ways to get around the spooks. As far as I'm concerned, this is one of the better games of the console generation. I obviously have played every game of the generation, but I can't imagine that Resident Evil 7 wouldn't be among them. Definitely worth your time. After the end of World War II, the world was split into two, East and West. This marked the beginning of the era called the Cold War. Metal Gear Solid is a good example on why I have the one game per franchise role, because half this list could have easily just been the Metal Gear titles. I've been a fan since my dad bought a copy of the NES Metal Gear for Walmart back when I was probably 6, 7 years old, and I got to play Metal Gear Solid when it was still relatively new, and I've been following the series since. The games have always had intriguing storylines, interesting boss battles, and this unique action gameplay. It's not as slow or boring as some people make out. You can you can play Splinter Cell if you really want to have to take your time. But you definitely can't normally go guns and blazing in a Metal Gear game. Stealth and planning out your next move are key to playing the game well. That said, I can only pick one. So out of the first three Solid games, I love them all. They all deserve to be on here. Let's go ahead and get Solid 2 out of here. Sons of Liberty? Nah, man. Sorry. But choosing between the original Metal Gear Solid and Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater is pretty difficult. And I've honestly have gone back and forth on this up until the 11th hour. So what's the setting of the games? In Metal Gear Solid, you play a snake, a retired special agent, who gets called back for one more mission. His old squad has turned terrorist and has taken over a nuclear storage facility up in Alaska. They're threatening to shoot a nuke if the government doesn't hand them the remains of a legendary soldier named Big Boss. Rather than hand over a dead body of a war vet, the president sends you in to rescue hostages and assess if they can launch a nuke, and then stop them all by yourself if they can. Of course, Things go horribly wrong, plot twists are revealed, characters with different agendas enter the scene. The story gets a little convoluted in the best way. Metal Gear Solid 3, you play as a newer agent named Naked Snake. You're sent in on a rescue mission to sneak a Soviet professor across the Iron Curtain in the 1960s. Everything goes wrong, and it turns out you're being betrayed by your mentor. Shit goes sideways, somebody uses a nuke, and now Russia's pissed. To clear our name, America is sending you back in to take out your former teacher. Of course, other characters enter into it. The story gets very convoluted. The story gets kind of goofy, honestly. And it's as hard to explain as a good Metal Gear game should be hard to explain. I like both settings. They're both pretty equal. I think you can accuse Snake Eater of going off the rails, but I also think the fact that Snake Eater pokes a little bit of fun at itself and just cheeses it up in the 1960s style of just, you know, being a little bit of camp kind of plays to his benefit. Metal Gear Solid 1, on the other hand, comes out more like 
like a serious 90s action movie, which works well for it, but I mean, 90s action movies haven't necessarily aged as gracefully as some of us would like to pretend. There's no denying that Snake Eater has a lot of kick-ass moments because it's willing to just let go. Like, this entire encounter between Snake and the boss, the boss comes out looking really badass. She's so cool, in fact, that you'll momentarily forget bullets don't fly like that. That's not to say there isn't a little levity in Solid 1, but Snake Eater definitely knows how to have a good time. Like, look at this. That said, it might be a little too goofy. Again, look at this, but you got you got a band of World War II soldiers that you're supposed to go up against, and they all have some kind of supernatural power. Kind of crosses between video game logic and starts going into JoJo stand territory. That's not to say that Metal Gear Solid 1 didn't have its share of supernatural tinted storytelling. There's Psycho Mantis, for one, and then a Volca Raven plays into the shaman stereotype, but it's definitely more on display in Snake Eater. Uh, here's a dude who can Trolls lightning. That's his thing. It's not gonna get explained. Well, what about the controls of both games? They both more or less play similar. You know, you move around from area to area, avoiding guards, sometimes having to take them out, collecting items to help use in future scenarios, and trying to get to the next boss battle. The games are mostly cutscenes, and a lot of those cutscenes aren't even animated. A lot of the games are just looking at text. I've uh, commented in the past that Metal Gear Solid was Kojima trying to like sneak in a visual novel and just like attach an action game on top of it so that we wouldn't all notice that we were trekked into playing a visual novel. That's of course an exaggeration, but you can go 45 minutes sometimes without playing any of the gameplay. For my money, the stories hold up well enough if you're into that kind of thing. I surprisingly think Metal Gear Solid 1 storyline holds up a little bit better as far as like lethal logic go, but it's a personal preference, and the characters in 3 are really fun. I love Mei Ling from Solid 1, she's like my first fictional crush, but Paramedic is just like a joy. Major Zero is a lot more of an interesting and just more fun character to interact with than Campbell is. Sick it's a riot. I am THE expert on weapons, equipment, and cutting edge technology. Ocelot makes an appearance in both games, and even though each game has their own antagonist, Ocelot kind of the villain of the series. Now, why this isn't his best appearance in the franchise, but he's got a lot more going on for him in Snake Eater than he does in Solid 1. Goofy stuff aside. It sounds like I'm gearing up to give this win to Metal Gear Solid 3, and before I sat down and recorded all this, I had every intention to do that. Here's the deal though, I played through both games pretty recently, a day or so ago as of this audio recording, and I found that the pacing in Snake Eater just isn't what I want it to be. You're either stuck waiting out guards, or you've been caught and you're stuck waiting out the timer, or you're abusing the game for the benefit of Comrade Santa Claus. Like, there's no in-between, and it's really hard to get that flow. Messing up in Snake Eater sets you back pretty hardcore. These aren't quite as big an issues in Metal Gear Solid 1. It's a lot easier to see where enemies are because of the radar. And I get that the radar is a bit of a cheat that the games wanted to move away from, but it really helps. It also allows you to keep a nice, faster pace than 3 does. Snake Eater really wants you to take your time and hide in grass and go hunting. There's this survival system, there's managing food, there's managing your health, there's a lot of menu hopping is what it is. And you also have to manage your backpack. You can't just pick up an item and then have access to it. You have to make sure that it's available in your backpack first. None of these are issues in Solid 1. You pick up an item, it's in your inventory, you hold down L2 or R2 as the case may be, and you use the item. There's not all these other systems to juggle and it just keeps you on the action. Evading guards, taking out enemies when you need to, finding where you need to be. I also think with the exception of having to go back and find the sniper rifle because Otacon's being kind of a bitch, Metal Gear Solid 1 doesn't ever feel like it drags. You're pretty much going at a good pace the whole step of the way. There are parts of Metal Gear Solid 3 that just go on way too long. This bit in the caves is bullshit. There's just other parts of the game later on that feel like they also drag. I think I'm being really nitpicky with these games. I think I'm wording things as if there's like these huge gaps between these categories. Like 3 has like way better characters and 1 has way better pacing. These games are more or less even. And if I had to recommend one, I would honestly tell you to go play all 3, including Solid 2. Don't think the fact that I already removed it from the conversation means it's a bad game. 
It's a fantastic game. But it's my list. Solids 1 and 3 are my two personal favorites. Guys, nostalgia is one hell of a drug, and I have a lot of nostalgia for Metal Gear Solid 1. I have a lot of nostalgia for these characters. This may be a case of why not both, but we're giving the nod the Solid 1. There's... Yeah, you all knew this was in top three, right? It's hard to know where to start when talking about Chrono Trigger. I truly believe it's one of Square Enix's best games. A collaboration between the then two separate companies, Square Enix managed to pull a lot of prominent developers together to create this game and using what Square touted as the active time battle version 2, the battle system is a unique twist to turn-based strategy. Enemies continuously move around the field and most of your special techs are area-based. You can wait out enemies and delay your inputs to try to deal the max damage. Depending on where one of your characters is located in the battle could depend on who they could easily reach. In addition to that, all of your characters not only learn their own set of techs and magic, but can learn dual techs or tri triple techs, meaning that over time, the characters can learn moves that they use together for devastating attacks. It's a fun system, and it helps keep the game fresh because different combinations of characters have different techs, meaning they all have different strategies. Our premise starts off pretty simple. Our main character wakes up in the year 1000. He goes to the fair and bumps into a random girl named, oh, um, one of these names, huh? Pretty sure it's Marla? Merle? Mar? No, I'm just gonna go Marl. Goes into a girl named Marl, and together they go meet his old friend, Luca, as she shows off a teleporting device that her and her father just made. Things go wrong and our hero's new friend gets zapped off through time. Realizing this, you, of course, don't hesitate to dive in and save her. And what follows is a adventure through time. You get to go through different time periods, meet up with a bunch of characters, both NPC and recruitable, and eventually you discover that a giant, he's, he's a tech guy, he is a giant space tech. A giant space tech crashes and effectively wrecks humanity's shit in 1999. So your ultimate goal becomes to stop the giant space tech. As soon as you're aware of who the big bad is, you're allowed to go challenge him right away. You're probably going to get your ass kicked. But the game uses New Game Plus. It's one of the first games to have ever done the concept, meaning you get to carry some of your equipment and your stats over to the next game. You can feasibly beat it at different parts of the story without having to go through the whole thing and level grind. But Chrono Trigger is definitely more about exploring areas and seeing all the side stories. And there's a lot of good stuff. I would be here way too long talking about Frog's backstory or Magus's and yeah, I'm going to pronounce that Magus. Or like the dozen so enemies or just like the offbeat humor. Also helping the humor is Akira Toriyama's signature art style. Everybody, of course, knows him from Dragon Ball and Dragon Quest, and this work is no exception to his others. It's phenomenal. Character designs are unique and memorable, and it goes a long way to add to the charm. I think if I had to describe the appeal of Chrono Trigger in one word, I would actually use the word charm. The game is charming, and in the best possible way. It never seems ham-fisted, but the game also knows not to have it bogged down in a bunch of heavy themes. You play as a main character who is just confident enough to, to go on the adventure, and then you just go on a bunch of smaller adventures on a quest to defeat the ultimate bad. And that's not to say it doesn't get heavy in parts, or that there aren't emotional moments. There are, and if you've played the game before, you know exactly what I'm thinking of. But it's just that with a lot of RPGs, especially a lot of those from like after the year 2000, we get used to a lot of downer protagonists, or games that felt like they're not mature if they don't try to tackle like every serious issue that plagues humanity somewhere down the line. Chrono Trigger never feels that it needs to commit to something like that, and it's just here to have fun. It knows that we're all here to have a good time, and that's what Chrono Trigger is to me. It's a good time.
Oh, and this should be pretty self-evident, but the soundtrack to this game is fantastic. At least somebody think that I forgot that Chrono Trigger has the best music of any video game ever. I think it definitely has the best soundtrack of any game on this list, which should be saying something. Most of these games have really good soundtracks. If you see this footage and do not understand why Super Mario Bros. 3 is on this list, then I don't know why I'm talking to you. You've left the YouTube autoplay on. Somehow this video got on there. You're probably at work not realizing that your laptop battery is dying. For everyone else who intentionally clicked on this video, you already know. You already know, guys. Mario 3 is one of the best platformers ever made. It's It's got it all. It's got really good examples of clever level design. It's got pleasing sprite work. It's got really good music. I said earlier in the video that Sonic 3 and Knuckles had a legendary score. If that's legendary, then the soundtrack to Mario 3 is just something we all like inherently know from birth. Anyone who's been in the vicinity of video games can hum this soundtrack. It's that good, that catch, that ingrained in our gamers' consciousness. It's a simple platformer. Start from the left, run to the right. Levels are really short. As a matter of fact, they're so short, I can just let an entire level play in the background while I'm speaking to you, and it'll finish up without you realizing that I'm being real lazy editing this video. Like, see, look, that level's done. Didn't take no time at all. But just because they're short doesn't mean they're easy. A lot of the levels have their challenge, get it out of the way, and then let you progress through the rest of the game. The general difficulty is actually an amazing accomplishment that games just don't achieve most of the time. Anyone can play this game. It starts off mind-numbingly easy. Four-year-olds can beat levels in Mario 3, but then it naturally progresses to where it gets really difficult. World 8 is hell. I mean, literally, but also figuratively, that's some hard shit. The airships are not easy. There are definitely some levels thrown about that will challenge everyone. And I find that some people find certain levels harder than other people would find them. So you never know who's going to get stuck on something. Meaning that a 30 year old or a 40 year old can play it with their 6 or 7 year old child and both people enjoy it on the same level and still find about the same challenge. I don't know how it pulls it off. Nintendo were geniuses back in the day. Everyone remembers the power ups. Each power up is unique and designed for a specific Terran of the level. They all have their uses. They're all kind of cool but i think everyone agrees the raccoon tail if you uh if you don't know what's coming up just do the raccoon tail hell even if you do know what's going up you're probably gonna do the raccoon tail what's better than that the tanuki suit but seriously it's the coolest power up in the game and there are so many secrets in this game these levels are packed with goodies unless somebody just tells you where everything is or you have a bunch of old issues of nintendo power you can play this game for years and still be discovering things i've been playing mario 3 since its american release sometime in the very early 90s and i swear as recent as last year I was finding parts of the levels that I did not know exist. And I used to play this game a lot, guys. Like, you know how kids are really OCD about playing the same game over and over and over and over again? My parents thought I had a problem. I've, I've logged in hours on Mario 3. I'm really surprised this segment has gone along as it did. I could have sworn I would only have to say about 30 seconds worth of justification. This is one of the best games ever made. This is definitely in the running for one of the greatest video games. Mario 3 is when we realized, oh, this gaming shit, it's, it's here to stay. And it's good. Not much to explain. I either sit here and just describe the game level by level and reaffirm that I love it, or we end it here. Super Mario Bros. 3, definitely my favorite Mario game. Definitely my favorite Nintendo game. Nice.
over the games a lot, guys. To me, there's something cathartic about just slamming notes to music. To be perfectly honest, we're in another situation like we were with Metal Gear Solid. If you gave me the option to play any given rhythm game, even if it's one I didn't particularly like, I'd probably play that with you a lot sooner than I would play a fighting game or a first-person shooter or anything else. I really love music games, guys. But I didn't want to make the whole thing rhythm games because the appeal to me is the same across the board. I would just be making the same points over and over. So, this seems weird to say that, oh, this entire expansive genre can only be represented by one game, but it's my lesson. That's what we're going to fucking do. I started playing Dance Dance Revolution back in, like, 2004. DDR Extreme was the newest one, and I got to watch the genre pretty much evolve for its heyday in 2006, 2007, 2008. I got to see the beginnings of Guitar Hero Return to the Rock Band, and DDR finally getting localized a little bit better than it had been previously. So, I felt like I've played pretty much every every music game that's been made available to me over the years. I'm a big fan of the Beat Mania 2DX series. As a matter of fact, 2DX Empress is one of my most prized games that I own. Shout out to Morty for getting that for my birthday. I'm not very good at it, please don't let the autoplay footage that you see make you think that I'm really good. These right here are like my realistic scores. But just because I suck or something doesn't mean it isn't fun to me. But between Dance Dance Revolution and Beat Mania 2DX, damn guys, I don't want to say that comes out of nostalgia, but if you gave me the choice between playing the two of them right now, I'd really want to play some Dance Dance Revolution. I don't get to because we don't have working machines around here, and home pad options have always been pretty meh, but the games are a blast. There's something really fun about physically getting up and using your feet to play the game. Other than the games that use a controller just don't capture that feel of magic. You can take the game as serious as you want you can be really casual put on easy setting just kind of goof about which is fun or you could take it like an athlete and a lot of people do a lot of chill people i know get real serious on that machine and hey you know what the game supports it it has a really good scoring system and there's a lot of fun trying to outdo your friends on the score there are probably close to 2,000 songs in the DDR canon right now. Depending on which particular version you play depends on your set list, but they all fundamentally play the same. Just, you know, over the years they've gotten better frame rates. But even if we narrow rhythm games down to Dance Dance Revolution, there are a lot of DDRs. I could just say the series as a whole. The appeal is the same, of course, as I explained. But that seems like a cheat when I made myself pick between Metal Gear. I don't want to have to try to compare all the DDRs we be here all day and other than aesthetics and song choices, which is personal for everyone, there's not much talk between them in most cases. Well, which ones I like as far as arcade machines go, Supernova and Supernova 2 are really fun. I've played a lot of Extreme. I've played a little bit of X and Fourth Style. Fourth Style has one of the best soundtracks to listen to outside of the game. But, you know, there's something about all that green and that 2002 interpretation of what the 90s look like that appeals to me. Nostalgia is one hell of a drug. I've said that already. I like Dance Dance Revolution Extreme. I think it still holds up. I think the general look of it is very of its time, which makes it really powerful to me. It's like aged in the best way. It's aged in that way where it just takes you back to the time that you first saw it. DDR games have always kind of looked weird. They look a little less weird now that uh, Japanese culture has become, I don't want to say mainstream, but a lot more accepted here in the West. When this came out in the arcade, it was the Japanese versions that we saw, and they wore their influence on their sleeve, and it was like a little bit of a culture shock, actually. It was, it was alluring in how unique it was from everything else in the room. I mean, I know that like a lot of arcade games were made by Japanese developers, but Tekken didn't really come off like this, you know? Like, look at this shit. My first experience with that was extreme. Maybe I'm biased. I went through the PlayStation 2 version recently to record some of this footage. And you know, I still think a lot of these songs hold up. They're quick, minute and a half, two minute, poppy, Eurobeat, J-pop dance tracks. Nothing's too deep here. It's just fun. And I think that's the appeal of Dance Dance Revolution to me. It's just pure fun anyone can get into at any skill level. So with that in mind, Dance Dance Revolution Extreme, my personal number one favorite game of all time. Hey guys, that's it. That's the list. Those are my top 10 favorite games of all time. Probably going to change as time goes on, but that's how it stands right now. Agree? Disagree? It's an opinion, so you really can't. But you're allowed to go in the comments and argue publicly if you want. 
I actually love talking about games and debating on how tiers work. It's just kind of a hobby of mine. So, in the last 20 seconds of this video, uh, here's what Google thinks that you would want to watch. And here's a recommendation I came up with here on the spot. Uh, check out some of the other videos. Hit like and subscribe. All that good stuff. You know how YouTube is. Thanks for watching. Here's uh, our Fatal Frame playlist too. Just thought I'd throw it out there.